Thank you. My name is Hongju Lee. I'm from South Korea. So this is who I am, but I, I have to skip it because I, I have a lot of things to talk, so just moving out. Uh, today I'm going to share my toy project, which is a logging metric, so home networks, and analyzing the data and doing some forecasts for detecting anomalies. Here's the outline for the whole process from the data collection followed by the time series analysis, followed by the forecasting, and then the modeling, the de uh, mod anomaly detections. Uh, uh, we're gonna go through all these items under each steps as long as time allows. But instead of completing everything for each stage, I will give brief overview at surface at first and gradually get deeper into each process by iterating the steps. So you will see a lot of figures at the beginning and then some text and codes later. There will be almost no, there are some, but almost no mass equations as we don't get into that much deeper. Oof. To start with a uh, naive approach of uh, anomaly detection. So let me share you how this project started at the very first beginning. When I was living in Hong Kong, I'm Korean, but I, I live for more than two years in Hong Kong. Uh, one day, internet started to fail continuously, so I made a call to the service provider, and the engineer came, and he tested the network with his own device. But at, at, at the time, it was not just normal, it, it, it was just normal, and I just could not reproduce the failure. And from the next day, I installed the speed test app on my smartphone, and started to capture the test result every time when the network went down. Then I called the engineer again and showed him the captured images of failures. This time he said, the wireless device is not just not reliable. So he asked me to test with the wire device. I was just pissed off. And at that time, the only uh, wired device I had was the Raspberry Pi with a LAN port. So I ran speed tests on a regular basis and kept logging for a few days be before the engineer's next visit. Uh, this is the graph I showed the engineer at the time in 2015. Uh, it, as you see in the graph, there we can see the disconnections repeated several times in a day in the upper, at the upper graph. There's a red crosses at the bottom, that's uh, disconnections. At last, the engineer uh, re replace the modem, and then the internet service went normal. So in this case, the disconnections are anomalies, but there are other types of anomalies in time series data we will see in the next slide. Uh, and there were actually for this kind of uh, uh, analyzing, it's, it's just not a, not a data analyzing, but uh, because there's no forecasting either, just we, just I just waited for some expected failures that to be repeated. So therefore, it's just a naive approach. Mm. Uh, before we go more deeper, let's generalize the problem and consider what we should be care about. What uh, the problem is detecting a normal states of home network. It, uh, in more general way, we can say anomaly detection for time series. So what is time series? The time series data is a set of observation on the value at different times. And such observation have to be collected at regular time intervals. And uh, for anomalies, there are several types of uh, anomalous pattern in se uh, time series. Let's take a look one by one. Okay. So firstly, the additive outliers, which is unexpected spikes and drops. The disconnections that we just saw is the typical type of this type of uh, anomaly. Next is the temporal changes. It's an unusual low or high observations for some short period of time. And next, uh, the level shift. In this case, the metrics doesn't change the shape, but total value of the period changes. As a statistical characteristic has been changed for the shift, uh, so we must 
there must be many things to be said again after detecting such anomalies. So the level shifts are very important type of anomaly we have to deal with. Uh, let's go to the next step. Uh, the second round is starting with the data collection. Okay, I use the speed test CLI, which is the command line tool written in Python for internet speed test. It simply gives you a metric uh, response time on ping test and download speed and upload speed. You can see the result. And I ran the test by using Cronta for every five minutes, and I collected almost 20,000 observations for three months. Okay, this is the log output looks like. Uh, each test is separable from the next test by delimiter, the three right symbols in series. Uh, some of you may have noticed that the test didn't start at the exact time. I found there are many cases of tests, the test started one or a few seconds later, but it does not make a huge difference and it can be easily corrected later, you'll see. And this is the iterator class that I use, which is reading the log string until the next delimiter happens and parse and store the metrics and date times. It's time to build a data, a data frame with pandas. Uh, I make a list of speed test objects, starting the log, uh, uh, I mean, uh, parsing the log string, and in the next, I build the data, a uh, daytime index for data frame. Here, this is how I manage with the incorrect starting time by expli explicitly setting zero seconds and zero microseconds for each data uh, index. It's very important for time series data, as I mentioned before. Uh, by definition, it has to be a regular uh, time period. So here's the, uh, the, the graph showing the uh, raw data. And the upper blue one is the ping test, and orange is uh, download speed, and the green one is the upload speed. So uh, the, actually we have to handle some missing data. The handling missing data in data science is very important. Sometimes it raises unexpected error on your code and uh, it's possibly lead us to incorrect results, which is even uh, more worse. So uh, we obviously see some accidental missing parts for a few days. Actually, the first part was failure of the Raspberry Pi, and uh, the second one is, I, I don't know, just server is not responsive. And in case, in, in this case, I cannot just fill up those missing data, it's too huge with arbitrary uh, values. So I just, it's, I think it's enough to train a model. I, uh, the first part is uh, plenty enough for training the data and I use the second part as a validation, and the last part as a test, uh, test data. Mm, in the raw data, there are a few cases of missing. We can hardly notice on the visualization, but, uh, but we have to examine carefully the missing data like this. So, so by using uh, the, uh, the code, blo uh, the, 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 just the first line, we can examine if there is any missing data in the data frame, and I manage it by propagating just the last valid observation uh, forward to the missing hole. This is one typical way to do. And here is how I handled the pandas uh, with the data frame, with the data time index. It's, uh, there was, actually there was, uh, it was yesterday there was a talk about uh, Panda indexing. It was really enjoyable to me. And handling time series with Panda is super convenient. So I can chop off the time series and resample it and make a groove for a certain period to, and do some aggregations. And these are a few examples I used. Frankly speaking, I, a few years back, at, the time when I don't know much about pandas, actually I was avoiding it because it, it, 
it gives me too much confusion. So at, at that time, I used to put the date time string or the date time object as an individual column, and then search the data, uh, data frame to get uh, a numbered index, and then query again. So <laughs> it was ridiculous, but I did, actually. So uh, don't be scared about, and the more we know, the less pain we will get. Now let's, look, uh, let's have a look into the data. So, uh, this is the hourly plot for each day from Monday uh, to Sunday for a week, 24 hours from zero o'clock on the on x-axis. Y-axis shows the download speed and megabit per second. As you see, there are no specific pattern repeating each day, but uh, maybe you can notice that there are less fluctuation at nighttime on the right side of the chart. And, uh, and the test capacity remains high. Next, I draw the box plot for each day. We can find a pattern in a week. So this is a uh, Sunday. Uh, uh, mouse pointer doesn't go to up there. So you can see it every Sunday. Uh, focusing the orange line, which is the median download speed for each day, it shows regular oscillation, and the median of Saturday and Sundays goes higher than the weekdays, so it is, is shows clear pattern. Like this kind of repeating pattern, we can categorize some pattern consisting the time series data. Uh, an observed time series can be decompose into three components. The trend exists when there is an increasing or decreasing direction in the series, and such trend components does not have to be linear. It could be exponential or uh, it can be de uh, decreased by a log. And the seasonal pattern exists when a series is uh, influenced by a seasonal factor. And lastly, the random noise, this is component of the time series uh, obtained after uh, other components have been removed. So it's uh, completely random and has zero mean and constant variation, which plays very important role for anomaly detection. We will see it later. So the time series can be formally defined with uh, like additive model or multiplicative model. We will deal with these components more later. For now, we just try to decompose the components with, uh, with a Python tool and see if there's are, there, there are trend and seasonal, seasonality on our time series. Here, I try to decompose the daily download time series for a week from Monday to Sunday into seasonal component and trend component. I use uh, I use the seasonal decompose function in stats model package, and you can see that there ex exists a seasonal pattern and clear trend, even if it was not clear with visualizing original data on your left side. Okay, it's time to build a model. Um, but before we go deeper into uh, modeling algorithm itself, we need to think about how modeling process of time series is different from that of original machine learning process with the time invariant data set. Uh, we can split the training data set into a training set and testing set, and use the training set to fit the model and generate a prediction for each element in the test set. This is a, one general way to train and validate the model. So say we have, uh, we, we divide the data into three parts, A, B, C, then train a model with part A and B and validate the model with part C, or repeat the same process, but with this time, uh, with B and C for training data and part A as a test data. This is, this is the typical process called cross-validation. Anyone who have expertise in machine learning uh, should be familiar with this. However, the cross-validation cannot be used for time series data because of the time dependency. 
Uh, part A has nothing to do with part B and C, it, so it is un unreasonable uh, to test the model with part A as a test set after training the model uh, with part B and C. Mm. So the model that is trained by old data affects less than that of recent data. We have to recreate the ARIMA model after each new observation is received. This is so-called uh, rolling forecast. So here's the piece of code running the, running the rolling forecast. We keep track of all observation in, in a list history uh, that is seeded with the training data initially and later new observations are appended for each iteration. Uh, we will step over each new observation in test data set and then build an update model with the previous observation. And with the updated model, we forecast one step ahead for the time t and then store the forecast value to a list. Lastly, uh, keep history updated with the new observation at time t. This is how we do the uh, rolling forecast. On your left side, as a forecasting result, the blue line uh, represents original data we saw before, and the orange line showing our prediction starting from the middle, uh, middle, middle of the week. Okay. Mm, so, uh, and, but, and just more important point here is the residuals on the right side. The code block calculating the residuals and plotting the residual distribution on the, on the right side. Resi residuals are a difference between actual observation at time t and predicted value at time t. It follows normal uh, distribution. You, you see the bell curve, and meaning it's, all, it's uh, just a white noise. It's very important, as I mentioned before, for anomaly detection. So it can be used for anomaly detection after getting residual based on a uh, robust forecasting model. So now we get residual with Gaussian random noise. Uh, with the residuals, outlier detection can be done with several ways by using interquartal range or standard deviation and median absolute deviation. For interquartal range, it's quite popular by sorting the data, their, the, uh, their median is in the middle, and the first quartile and third quartile are positioned at 25% 20 for, uh, lower and 75% upper, respectively. That is, if the data point is in red area, uh, it, it, it is considered being too far from the center, a value to be reasonable, hence it's an outlier. Uh, I can implement like this with NumPy or Py, uh, uh, Pandas. Mm. With the standard deviation, uh, if a value is a certain number of standard deviation away from the median, the data point is identified as outlier. Uh, the specific number of standard deviation is called threshold. Usually, uh, we use three standard deviation it, it, the three standard deviation is most common, I think. And also in, with code, we can obtain outliers like this with NumPy or uh, panda, Pandas. Okay, for median absolute deviation, it's the uh, most powerful thing in naive approach. So we have univariate barrier data set and the MED is defined as a median of absolute deviations from the data median. That is, uh, get the data median first and then take a residuals for each data and uh, median absolute deviation is the median for the absolute value, uh, values of the res uh, residuals. So it's more clear with uh, equations. Uh, so if a value is a certain number of mid, uh, median absolute deviation away, say three med from the median of the res residuals, that value is classified as an outlier. Mm. 
There is a short paper uh, detecting outliers. Uh, do not use standard deviation around the mean, use absolute deviation around the median. It's published in 2013. It gives, it just, uh, I, as I remember, remember, it just has this four pages. And it gives a super clear idea why we should use MET other than the other, other ways. Uh, I highly recommend it, I, I, I will highly recommend it to read it if you are interested in it. So the next step. Uh, we go through the ARIMA. Uh, the ARIMA is a class of statistical model. It's just a classic. It, it developed maybe 60 years ago, but yet it's really powerful. And it is, can be used to modeling and analyzing and forecasting time series data. Uh, ARIMA performs well with stationary time series. So we need to understand the meaning of stationary time series and how to transform non-stationary data into stationary data. To understand the stationary data, here are the three criterion of stationarity. The mean variance and covariance of the series are the, are time in, should be time invariant, meaning uh, the mean of the series should not be function of time. So in the graph, the left-hand graph satisfying the condition, uh, whereas the graph on the right, right side in red color has a time-dependent uh, mean. And the mean value continues to increase as time goes. The next, the variance of the series should not be a function of time. As you can see in the chart uh, following, the, the graph depicts that uh, the, the, the blue graph is the stationary series, and you can notice that the varying spread of distribution in the right-hand graph, which is not stationary. And lastly, the covariance in the, ti uh, in the time series should not be a function of time. So in the following graph, you will no notice that spread, uh, sp the, the speed uh, the spread spread becomes closer as the time increases. <coughs> Hence, the covariance is not a constant with time for the red series. We can test the stationary uh, for a time series with Python library. In statistics, we have Dickey Fuller test for testing the stationary, and stats model package has the implementation of the test. So, in the test statics, mm, you see at the bottom, test statics goes below 1% critical value, then we can consider the time series as stationary. Uh, but what if, what if the time series, uh, uh, time series is not stationary? The main problem with dealing time series data is they are, they are just not stationary. So we, we have to make it stationary before doing something. Uh, so, uh, so when the data is not stationary, there are statistical properties like mean, variance, and maximum or minimum value changes over time. In general, a, s a series which is stationary after being differentiated uh, the d times, it can be, uh, I mean, the non-stationary data can be stationary by differencing the value from, for a certain order. So it, it is said to be integrated of order D and denoted I of D, which is the subtraction of Y at time T minus uh, Y of time minus D. So the integrated here is what the character I in the middle of, of ARIMA stands for. Okay. Uh, the auto, 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 regressive, uh, auto regression. Uh, to simplify, the auto regression is just a linear regression of itself for p time steps, uh, p, p time steps of lag times. So the auto or auto means the self in ancient Greek. So uh, 
the linear regression has uh, several features, but in auto regression, there's no feature but the time series, but it's regressing by itself over time. A moving average is simply, uh, it's, it's doing the similar way. The moving, moving average is self-linear regression, not with actual observation, but with the number of residual error uh, in previous timestamps. So putting all together, here's the summarized ARIMA model, and, it's, it, and it, it required parameters. We need p-value for the number of lags observations included in the model for autoregression, and d, the degree of differencing, the number of times that raw observation are differenced or integrated, and lastly, the P, a Q, the size of moving average window. Um, so actually, it's a bit hard to understand those concepts, but uh, maybe it's just enough to, uh, to study how to identify such parameters, um, which is not simple either. Um, but we can, we, we have autocorrelation function and partial autocorrelation function that tells us how many lags we should consider for forecasting. So basically, the co correlation of a time series observation is calculated with value of the same series as period of time. That is why we call auto a correlation. So the autocorrelation function is the correlation between the current time step with the uh, previous time step. And the partial autocorrelation function does the same as autocorrelation function, but this time it removes autocorrelation of intermediate time lag between current time t and current time, uh, the, the previous time uh, t minus q. And sometimes plotting the ACF and PACF gives us hint for selecting a remote parameter. This is a simplified guidelines for selecting P and Q by uh, plotting ACF and PACF. Mm. Also in the reference, there are the guide, which is more precise. This one, I gave you the super summarized, but there is a uh, long story. <laughs> and, but I recommend you to read it if you want to study Arima further. So I'll give you a simple exa example, which is an easy case for identifying the parameters. Uh, this data is not from my own project, but it gives you a clear idea. So the upper, upper uh, graph is autocorrelation function, which is tails off. And the bottom, it is partial autocorrelation function, cuts off after lag two. You, you see the the third one is lag two. The first one is the itself, so the correlation should be, should be one. The current time, time step is exactly the same as the current one, so the lag zero should be one, and it cuts off after lag two, which means it's better to use a moving average than uh, autoregression. So we can parameterize like zero for P and two for Q but it does not go, it, it always not goes like that, simple. So this comes from my own data we saw previously, and it is more complicated. So I just use the grid search to find the parameters. Do you, do you know what the grid search is? Okay, the grid search, uh, it is, it's just uh, finding uh, optimal parameters uh, first, we take a certain range of parameters and conduct exhaustive search until we get the base, best result. So we can measure the best result by arbitrary measurement like uh, mean square error or Bayesian information criteria, so on. So it's quite effective for uh, searching optimal parameters for IML as well. 
Okay, now, now say we have two residuals by forecasting download speed and upload speed separately with Arima model. With the two univariate data, it's time to do anomaly detection again. Sometimes the naive, naive, naive approaches I introduced before does not work well, depends on data distribution, because the usually data, uh, they show the skew, some uh, highly skewed data is more common than normal distribution. However, with the residuals distributed according to Gaussian, we can get more robust results. One way is the parameter estimation. So say we have a, on the, a, in the blue graph, say it's a distribution of download speed, and for orange, the dis distribution for upload speed, to be more precise, is actually residual of forecasting upload speed. Then we have, we can estimate the mu, the, uh, the mean of that distribution and variance of each di distribution. And uh, we can have a probability density function of each. And then by multiplying them, we can have a model. And then when the new uh, observation comes, then we can test it by cutting off the threshold. However, this, this method has a problem. When the data points are covariant and scatter around uh, a certain pattern, say the diagonal ellipse, as you see in the, uh, in the graph, then the upper left bottom right data point should be anomalies, while upper right and bottom left are just normal. But it's basically is in the same distance from the middle. So how can we deal with this? We can, we can solve this problem with Gaussian distribution. Say this time we can estimate the mean and get a covariance metric sigma. And then with some formula, we can get the prob probability distribution function, then do the same test. This, okay, the code is more, maybe it's more simple. So this is the Gaussian, uh, the multivariate Gaussian distribution, anomaly detection. And you see we can, with the SciPy package, we can estimate the Gaussian, the, the, the mean and the sigma. And then we can calculate the multivariate Gaussian probability, distrib probability, probability distributed function and then find the anomalies by, um, by conditioning with the threshold. The finding the threshold is, the, is another, another level, so it's not covered in this talk. Okay, I almost finished, more faster than I expected. Uh, we can replace the model with others, such as LSTM. There are there are, there are many ways to forecast the time series, but one trendy technology is the uh, long short-term memory, uh, which is one of deep learning technique. LSTM is useful for sequence learning, which enables to learn long dependency, and it outperforms other methods and applications such as language modeling and speed recognized. Uh, as you see in the, in, in, in the figure, the blue boxes in the bottom are time series inputs, and the green boxes in the middle are LSTM cells, and the yellow boxes represent the cells uh, outputs which is propagated to the next cell. So it has a memory uh, considering the previous time step. And finally, the red box is predicted output. So we feed a series of ti t time steps from zero to t minus one for predicting the target value at time t in the red box. Uh, a beauty of LSTM is each element in time series uh, can be a vector with multiple features. So we can train and predict the download and upload speed and response time at once and do the multivariate Gaussian uh, efficiently. So before 
uh, we are, uh, while we are using our EMA model, we have to do the forecasting and taking the residuals for each for the future, for downloading and uploading and ping test, but with the LSTM, it's simply just done at once. Here's a code block. It's just one sample, uh, but actually it is meaningless because there are so many variations, meaning there are a lot of things to study and understand to get a robust result out of, uh, out of LSTM. So actually, I could not get a robust uh, result with uh, LSTM, and neither, I, I, I haven't saw anybody uh, have done, uh, have showed a good result. Actually, there are several papers, they are, uh, they succeed with forecasting uh, with robust uh, result in time series, but it's not reproducible because they didn't, didn't uh, uh, open how they get the, how they train the model, or sometimes they don't uh, describe about how to, to get, how to train how to get the hyperparameters to find for fine tuning. So they just, just say they, they, are, they succeed. So actually, it's ongoing research, requires a lot of work to build a model for time series, but will, it will allow to model, soft, uh, model the soft, uh, soft, sophisticated and seasonal dependencies in time series. It's also, as I mentioned, it's very helpful with multiple uh, time series. And still there are change, uh, challenges. It can take a long time to run, so it could be very expensive to do a rolling forecast because whenever a uh, new observation comes, it has to update the model. Then when it, uh, when it costs a lot, then we can follow up the new observation. And it often requires more data trained than other models and have a lot of input parameters to tune. All right, to summarize, so be prepared before calling engineers for service failure. And Pythonista has a lot of uh, all powerful tools to uh, all of this. And also Pythonista needs to understand few concepts before using the tools. That's the most difficult part we need to study. And deep learning for forecasting time series is just a still ongoing research. And most importantly, do try this at home. Okay, here's my context. I'm not familiar with social networks, so just emails and you can contact me by email. All right, I have a few more minutes to get some questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for showing us what's happening on our broadband connection. Who has a question? Thanks for your talk. Did you consider that other traffic on your home net network may have interfered with the data that you were generating? In other words, if you were watching video, for example, that may have contended with the download speed that you were measuring. Oh, wow, I'm sorry. It's really hard to understand here to... <laughs> it's He made a really good question, so. Okay. Uh, when I get this uh, plot, I, I, I was curious about while I'm downloading or doing heavy stuff on network, it would affect this chart, right? And, and yeah, so I searched internet what would affect uh, speed test, and yes, it does affect. When, I, when I'm downloading or doing heavy stuff with my uh, network, then it should, uh, the measurements should go down. But, 
Actually, I found some interesting things. And in the last two days, on Saturday and the Sunday, at that day, I was not at home. I was, went to, for a, a travel. But still, there are fluctuations in the daytime. So, so my assumption is, uh, more than my personal use, I think the more factors would affect for my uh, village neighbors who share the, the backbone. So, so such pattern of my neighbors is just a, a, just a random. So therefore, we can have such patterns. If I don't have such patterns, and it only affects with, affects with my own usage, then that could, cannot be random. So uh, this study can make sense because it's, it's more affected by the, my neighbors. Okay. Thanks. Another question? Still have time for one or two questions. Yes. In the end, in the end did you fix your internet connection? At the end, in the Hong Kong, I finally uh, could manage the connection problem. But actually, there was no such severe connection problems at this time. I just did for fun. So, <laughs> but maybe I can do some more things and forecast. If I get more robust result, then I can, I can predict when we will be failed in the future. Or uh, maybe we can collect the data from the from the different houses and gather some collective uh, intelligence out of this. That could be <laughs> interesting. So now you're prepared. Another question? Okay. Well, thank you a lot for showing us what's happening in our connections. And uh, we'll have next talk in about five minutes about uh, pandas, which you also used. Thank, Thank you for paying attention. Thank you. Thank you.